Hello, everyone. It's Tuesday, December 6th. Welcome to the final bar. We're going to be talking with John Kosar from Asbury Research, trying to make sense of this market, accelerating to the downside. Monday session deteriorating, further deterioration today. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the final bar. Hey, everyone. Welcome to the final bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the chief market strategist here at StockCharts.com in a cloudy Redmond, Washington. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close as we break down the activity in the markets using the power of stock charts. The technical toolkit arguably is ideal for this sort of scenario when things seem uncertain, when it's a challenging market, when we have a lot of inflection points, a lot of movement. Charts are there to help you understand what is actually happening because there is message embedded in price. Price can tell you a lot about who's doing the buying and selling, whether it's fear or greed, whether it's euphoria or desperation. What is fueling these movements? Uh, you know, my my guest today, John Kosar, and uh, many others in the technical analysis community really have made a career out of analyzing these trends. And we hope to share some of that those insights with you today on the show. A lot of great guests, by the way. John Kosar from Asbury Research is joining us here shortly. We have a couple other really good guests through the remainder of this week. Leslie Juflas is going to join us tomorrow on the show on Wednesday the 7th. On Thursday the 8th, Frank Capillary. Frank was uh, with Instanet for a number of years, just recently started his own service earlier this year. So we be interesting to get his take on the market. Then coming up the week after, on Tuesday the 13th, we have Sean McLaughlin of All Star Charts. He's their options strategist. So we'll see what sort of options plays make sense in a market that certainly uh you know choppy and uh potentially in a uh, in a reversal phase let's continue on today's show with our market recap i did want to start uh quickly here with a poll we asked you recently on our social media accounts on uh twitter on youtube uh on uh elsewhere what market environment do you find the most challenging bull markets bear markets or sideways markets over half of you voted that last one sideways market which to be honest if you look at a lot of charts even though they've had a lot of movement directionally, how much have stocks really changed from three to six months ago? For a lot of charts, it's actually not that much, right? We've had upswings and downswings. We've sort of rotated around, but it's sort of been a bottoming process, if if that's uh, if that's maybe how I might describe it. It's really been sideways in all ways. Now, there have been outliers that have done very well and outliers that have been struggling, like communication services, but the average stock has been sort of in a choppy sideways mode for a little while. Only 7% of you said bull markets are the most challenging. And I think I would agree. Sideways markets are the most challenging and the most frustrating because it feels like everyone's disappointed. But I will tell you in terms of learning experiences, bear markets, I've learned more from one bear market than from 100 bull markets. I think that is absolutely the case. So here's for more bear markets. That's not what I mean, but you get it. It's good to, uh, it's good to continue learning about market dynamics. And let's talk about the market recap today and what's actually been happening. The S&P really pushing lower through the course of the day. A bit of a nice bump here uh, around the 2.30 p.m. time. So going into the close, the S&P bounced a little bit off the lows, but the damage really was done through the bulk of the day. The S&P finishing below, actually just uh, above 39.40. That's down 1.4% from yesterday. It was the Nasdaq that led the way lower with the Nasdaq Composite and the Nasdaq 100, both down about 2%. Mid caps and small caps actually outperformed. They're still down about 1%. Uh, but uh, but under uh, excuse me outperforming the S and P, which was down a little bit uh, a little bit more than that, and the VIX continuing to push higher. I, you know, it's 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 funny in the heat of the moment when you're going day to day, minute to minute, and analyzing the markets, it's easy to get caught up in some of these short term narratives. But you know, looking back, I, I wonder if the VIX hit, hitting twenty again here in the last week or two may have been one of the great signals of the year. Right, you have a rally into the two hundred day moving average, just like we did in August. The VIX gets down to about 20, just like it did in August. And so far, the last two days have been pretty painful coming off of the recent swing high as the VIX bounces up off of that uh, 20 level. I think more to be said there for sure. And there's this interesting push and pull, right? December actually tends to be a pretty good month for stocks. We're not feeling it so far uh, this week. 
Interest rates pushing lower uh, overall. Uh, yesterday, actually, uh, rates were going higher a little bit, uh, but today going back to the uh, to the downside with the uh, 10-year yield, uh, just about 3.5%, around 351. This is down from around 360 uh, yesterday. The dollar index, actually no big change in the UUP. It's kind of flat from where it was uh, yesterday. Bond prices obviously going higher as yields are, uh, are, uh, are uh, coming down. In, uh, in uh, silver and gold, the precious metals, both of those, not too much of a change, to be honest with you. Gold was up about a quarter of a percent. Broadly speaking, commodities uh, were feeling some pain today. The energy sector actually came off. Sort of an interesting mix in terms of the leadership and laggership today. We'll look at the sectors in a little bit more detail here in a moment. But interesting to see technology, communication, services, consumer discretionary, the three sort of fang sectors at the bottom of the list, but energy in there as well, down 2.6%. Finally, cryptocurrencies, mixed bag overall. Bitcoin uh, uh, sort of flat from yesterday. Ether prices coming off yesterday by about half a percent. Uh, both Bitcoin and Ethereum have struggled to regain any sort of footing sort of around the FTX, Binance sort of whole debacle here in the last uh, in the last month or two. Uh, and so overall, really uh, looking for a bid, looking for investors to come in and push those prices higher. I have not really seen that, broadly speaking, just yet. Let's look briefly at a chart of the S&P 500. I know talking with uh, John Kosar before the show, we're going to dig a little bit into the S&P and some, uh, and some big picture signals. So I just want to uh, talk briefly about what has happened. We can talk to John about what we might, uh, what we might expect next year. But you know, it's worth noting that uh, when you look at the rally uh, from the October low to uh, where we hit about a couple of days ago, this is uh, Thursday, Wednesday, Thursday of last week, I think on a closing basis, we're up about 13 or 14 percent off of the uh, the lows. Right, the intraday low is down below 3,400, but on a closing basis, we actually went just below uh, 3,600 before rallying. So we're about 14 percent above those levels uh, when we get to 4,100. That's kind of right in the middle of the 11 percent gain we saw in March and the 17 percent gain we saw in June. So. By bear market rally standards in 2022, this has actually been a pretty reasonable kind of normal uh, reality, a, a rally, if, that, if that's something we can gauge from two other observations, sort of right in the middle there. But again, as I'm as I'm stepping back from my monitor, sort of drawing on my time at the Fidelity chart room, a lot of what we would do is look at these big, large charts and just take a couple steps back from the wall and see what stood out. And I'll tell you what stands out is a downtrend channel starting in January. It's just kind of going slowly and steadily downwards, right? Lower highs, lower lows, particularly if you look at like a weekly chart, seems almost to jump out of, you know, that that pattern tends to continue until you see signs of a reversal, see signs of exhaustion. I think what we're seeing so far this week is maybe we haven't seen that uh, seen that quite yet. Let's look at some other charts here. I want to go to the um, the Mindful Investor live chart list. chart list. This is a list of charts that I keep updated. I just want to hit on a couple of them very quickly um, to talk about uh, breath, you know, breath conditions overall, um, you know, coming off of it, certainly in the last uh, in the last day or two, this chart in particular hasn't been updated yet for today's close. These are the advanced decline lines for the four major sort of groups of U.S. stocks that I would look at. The New York Stock Exchange is at the top and uh, large caps, mid caps and small caps. And if you look, all four of these, uh, you know, made a new low in uh, September into October from there have actually been a nice uh, steady incline, right? All of them have gotten above their 50-day uh, moving average. Given the sell-off that we saw today, I don't think any of these would break their 200-day moving average, um, or excuse me, their 50-day moving average on this day, but I might be wrong. I, we'll have to see what the closing data uh, would tell us, but that's certainly something I would be watching here, just like on a, on a stock moving higher is it able to hold its 50-day moving average on a uh, on a pullback? That might be something I would look at with these advanced decline lines. When you're looking at the percent of stocks above their key moving averages, this is updated for today's close. You can see we're up to around 92% of the S&P members above their 50-day. That's now down to around 78%. So still not a big change from where we uh, where we were uh, a couple of days ago, as we're you know just teasing the 200-day moving average briefly going above above there before pulling back a little bit. So overwhelmingly, most stocks still uh, in a in a decent upswing and holding their 50-day moving average. That starts to decline. That gets below 50%. That would certainly be a cause for concern. Same thing, about 57% of the S&P members still holding their 200-day moving average. The bear scenario from here, if this was a bear market rally and that bear market rally is now done and we're going to retest new lows, the good news about charts like this is they will tell you as things roll over, right? Right now, it's a big question mark, I think, right? Whether we continue lower or not. But these indicators holding sort of these bear mark, or excuse me, bull, bullish sort of uh, level. So holding about 50%, I think for both of these would be a sign of encouragement, right? It would tell me that 
things are probably not too bad. But if those levels break, I would certainly be uh, be uh, a little bit cautious about what may come next. Final thing I just want to hit on very quickly here is looking at the relative strength of consumer discretionary versus consumer staples. This is making a new low here. So while the S&P was trying to make a new swing high, right, getting to 4,000, getting up to 4,100, can it get to the August high around 4,300? While all of that is happening, the relative performance of consumer discretionary, kind of traditional offense to consumer staple, sort of traditional defense, Close to making a new 50-week low. That might be an interesting, important narrative as we think about whether this market is in a bullish configuration. This one ratio is telling you not the case. Let's take a quick commercial break. We'll be back with today's guest, John Kosar. We'll see you in a minute. Welcome back to The Final Bar. This is Dave Keller here at StockCharts.com. It's such a pleasure to bring you the show every trading day, and we appreciate you tuning in. A couple of quick announcements before we bring our guest uh, on, John Kosar. First off, we welcome your questions. We're going to do a mailbag segment a little later in today's show, and we'd love to feature one of your questions in our next mailbag on Friday's show. You can get your questions to us via email, thefinalbar at StockCharts.com. We're also on Twitter at FinalBarSCTV. And we are on YouTube. Put a comment below the video you're watching on our Stock Chart YouTube channel. We'll gather all those questions. Hope to answer one of yours live on the air on Friday's show. Also, go to StockChartsTV.com. That is our on-demand platform. We're so fortunate to have really knowledgeable uh, experts like John Kosar and many others sharing their insights. All of their discussions are available for free at StockChartsTV.com or on your mobile device. Just search for Stock Charts TV on demand. I want to welcome on today's guest, John Kosar. John's been a frequent guest on The Final Bar. He's the Chief Market Strategist of Asbury Research in Chicago. John, great to see you. Thank you for bravely coming on the show as we uh, have a distribution week so far. Yeah, I seem to have kind of a knack for this. Whenever the market blows up, I'm on TV. So. We're gonna we're gonna start publishing your uh, your your appearance schedule so people can start to plan ahead for it maybe a little bit. But we yeah. have your chart of the S and P 500 up here first, John. Talk us uh, talk us through how you're making sense of what we're seeing uh, today. Sure. Let's go back to this 3600 area. It was actually 3588. So we tested it pretty much right on the money back in June. Held. Um, it took us right, yeah, that's back here, took us into the August highs. We came down, we broke it for a, maybe a half a day or whatever, and then we had that really strong close. So the market obviously saw that. And now guess what? We're right back up here. And there's three different levels that are making resistance here. You've got in pink, the 20, 2022 major downtrend line. You've got the low from back in the end of February at 41.15. And then, of course, you have the 200-day moving average at 40.44. You could look at kind of hit all three of them and turned around. This is the place where if you've been bearish the market and you've been wondering how the market could possibly rally because we're going into recession and things are so terrible, this is vindication day for you. If you're bearish, this is kind of where you put on your strategy because you could lean against 41.15. So it's a very logical place for people that are either looking to go short or hedge portfolios to do it with very little risk. Mm, it's really interesting. Can you talk just a little bit about if we would continue lower, what sort of levels are uh, are meaningful for you uh, looking at the chart of the S&P? Yeah, 39.12 is the first level. I think we got down to 39.18 today and had a little bounce at the bell. So the market sees it. It's the November 1st high. And then you can see we came and kissed it as a low about a week after. So the market sees that. The level that I think is more important right now is the 50-day moving average. That's at 38.18. Let's call it 38.20 just to make it a round number. That's where the bulls are going to say, well, the minor trend is still up. So mm -hmm. in between is that's like the line of scrimmage. And on both sides, they like use a football metaphor. They're both trying to push it over, over one side or the other. Mm, it's really interesting. Now, when we've had you on the show before, we featured your Asbury 6 model, sort of looking at underneath the hood, if you will, at, at some of the conditions. How has this model evolved here in the last week, and, and what would you be looking for going forward? Well, it went, uh, it turned green back um, or positive, four or more green 
cells, four or more of these six indicators being green is positive signal. And one positive, I think, on October the 14th. Mm. Um, as of uh, the Thursday of last week, they were all green. And then you can see on Friday the 5th, we lost investor asset flows. Uh, we really lost them hard today. I was talking, uh, we were talking uh, off camera where uh, SPY lost $9 billion just yesterday. I'm very curious to see what happened today. And then we lost trading volume yesterday. I ran the model midday today, and we're going to be really close to turning red. So mm -hmm. if we turn red, which is four or more, that's going to tell me that the move up that the A6 found on October the 14th is over. And it would be one of a couple of different indications, including volatility that you mentioned, that would just more or less confirm to me that the downtrend is still um, intact, is still healthy, and it's re-engaging. I don't have enough to go by that yet, but I would guess by the end of the week, this model is going to move one way or the other, and that'll be a that'll go a long way in telling me which way the market's going into the early part of next year. Now, obviously, we have so many potential catalysts for stocks here, John. We've got inflation data that can come out. We have the Fed meeting next week. All the seasonal tendencies, which tend to be pretty strong in, in December. But as you look forward through year end and into the beginning of next year, given all of this sort of big question mark on the S&P, how do you position yourself in this sort of environment? Where do you look for opportunities? Is it a is it a time to just be defensive and sit on your hands? Or how would you be looking for opportunities here? One really interesting thing, one of the models we have, it's called the CART model, it's cross asset. Throughout this entire move higher from October through now, you've still had negative relationships where blue chips are outperforming broad mm -hmm. market. Broad market was outperforming technology value over growth. Um, so even though the market, I think this is 14% or something like that from bottom to top here, even though we had that nice rally, it's telling me relationships wise, the market really never bought into it. It's mm -hmm. still um, setting itself up for the resumption of this trend because it's still favoring what I would call the burrows, you know, rather than the racehorses. <laughs> That's well said there, John. Listen, it is awesome to have you on as always. Thanks for updating us on uh, some of your work and what you're seeing. Stay safe and be well there in Chicago. We'll talk to you again soon. See you next time. Thank you for having me. That's John Kosar. John's the uh, chief market strategist at Asbury Research in Chicago, and I love his uh, chart of the S and P. And again, what what's great about John and, and and with the Asbury Six is it's thinking of the market sort of holistically, right? And I love if you if you picked up on his comment at the end, it's sort of given the leadership, given the status of what's what's happening there. You know, the market really ne didn't necessarily maybe believe in this uptrend, but. It's all about the levels, right? Do those levels hold? And I'm certainly going to be watching that 50 day moving average around 3820 or so, as uh, he was highlighting. We hold that. And I think the bulls still have a hope of justifying that this is just a pullback within a recovery. We start failing at the 50 day, and boy, the lower lows can happen very, very quickly. That's not too far below that level. Great take there, as always, uh, by John Kosar. Let's continue on our show today with the final bar mailbag. As a reminder, the mailbag is always open. Our email is the final bar at stockcharts.com. And let's get to question number one. David, it seems like we are setting up for higher rates ahead. Would you agree and why? And you shared this chart. This is actually your chart of dollar sign TNX. And as a reminder, when you send in questions, click on the permalink uh, below the uh, sharp chart. If you're using ACP in the lower left, there's a little uh, button to share your chart, a little arrow. Click on that. Just send me that link with your question. Then I can bring up the live version of whatever chart you're asking about. It makes it super easy. Your chart of dollar sign TNX is highlighting this trend line, which is really interesting. Taking the low from early December, from mid-December, that uh, lines up decently with early March. That lines up pretty well with early August. And that happens to line up pretty well with where we're at right now. You know, we've been talking uh, for a little while now about how um, a lot of assets are sort of hitting key levels, right? You have the dollar coming off of new uh, long-term highs, breaking down to a key Fibonacci level, breaking down to its own 200-day moving average. You have the S&P 500 in a clear downtrend in 2022, rallying off the October low, testing its 200-day from up low, testing a key trend line resistance from the 2022 highs. Flip that chart over and you basically have the chart of 10-year uh, of yields, right? taking a trend line at testing the lows, taking the 200-day moving average, and you can see that we're testing support here. Just like the S&P is testing resistance from below, you have long bonds and uh, and 10-year uh, and bonds uh, yields that is testing uh, trend line support. 
and moving average support from above. This is why I think we're at a potentially really interesting point in the markets. One of two things, of course, is going to happen here, right? Either the S&P most likely, uh, you know, or the S&P breaks above its 200 day, breaks above 4,100, pushes toward the August highs, gets through that last, uh, that trend line, sort of that last level of resistance, and it's sort of onward through the seasonally strongest part of the year. In that case, I would say most likely bonds are part of that recovery and interest rates break down below this trend line support. Or the opposite happens, which is stocks fail to eclipse their 200 day or hold that breakout which this week so far is suggesting and uh, an interest rate sort of find support and break higher. That latter thesis makes much more sense to me. And that's what I've been talking about on the show here. That's what we've been talking about with our premium members of market misbehavior. And I think, you know, being defensive and cautious, given the fact that a lot of these things that have had reversals in the last six weeks are now at key points where if there's going to be a mean reversion back to the trend in 2022, this is kind of where and when it most likely happens. Uh, so my my assumption would be actually rates go uh, rates go higher from here. And given what the Fed is expecting, uh, you know, it's basically telegraphed they're going to do next week and into next year, that suggests higher rates from here. And I think most likely a recession that we have to deal with in 2023. But again, not a recommendation. Please do your own analysis. And let's get to question number two. Dave, I've heard several strategists this week begin uh, are saying that they are buying, quote, quality defenses. Can you define what that means? Yeah, so absolutely. So a lot of times we'll talk about um, phrases like quality and, and other things. And, and I found some people are not as particularly uh, comfortable with those levels. So um, quality, I, what I would basically tell you is you kind of know it when you see it, I guess is the way I would describe it. Quality companies are good companies with good structures, with good ability to earn, um, earn, uh, you know, grow earnings over time. Uh, stable companies, things that are not sort of uh, um, uh, fickle and uh, short-term oriented. The opposite of a high-quality company would be a very risky company, right? So things like emerging technology or newer biotech names, um, uh, things like that, that you're not 100% sure if this thing's going to make it, and you're making a lot of assumptions about their ability to you know, uh, follow through on expectations years down the road. Something like a Walmart or a Microsoft or an ExxonMobil kind of has it figured out. And while they can improve and change things, right, things like the Microsoft, uh, like the cloud uh, computing, obviously, is a, is a new business model. But overall, it's shown uh, its ability to uh, generate capital over time. So quality stocks are basically companies that have shown their ability to earn money and pretty consistently is how I would describe it. There are ways to, you know, maybe further define that, but that's how I would loosely categorize it. Defensive sectors would be things like consumer staples, utilities, real estate, um, you know, areas of the market that tend to do better when the market conditions are challenging, right? Sort of a safe haven where you'd park in. So saying we're going to rotate to quality defensive means the market is uncertain. Let's get into stable, large, um, you know, probably lower volatility types of uh, companies that have shown their ability to get through different um, uh, business cycles, particularly painful ones, and are most likely going to, likely going to come out of this uh, in good shape. Um, if you look around, you find some great ways. We we uh, we have a limited ability to do that on stock charts. We have because we have some fundamental data. Part of our plan for 2023 is to build out the fundamental data on our platform, incorporating all of that into our scanning tool. In which case, I will be happy to uh, conduct a special event on screening for quality defensives. But for now, I would look for defensive sectors and big stable companies. You know, that's a good way to uh, to follow through on what they're suggesting. Next question. How would you interpret the current trend of ADP? It looks like a cup and handle pattern seems to break out to new all-time highs, but is it not losing momentum? And this is your chart that you sent. Again, thanks for sending the permalink so I can uh, look at your live chart. So the way you have this laid out, we've got the relative strength of ADP, and that's a software company uh, payment processor kind of going up into the right. I think the relative strength is one of the most um, compelling parts of uh, this chart, to be honest with you. Just the fact that ADP is you know, at or near new highs, while the average technology stock is not, tells you why it's such a strong, positive outlier in the sector. After that, you have momentum. We have PPO, which is a, um, you know, a trend following device, accumulation distribution, which is positive, PMO, which is similar to uh, to the PPO. So when I'm looking at, you know, just that section of your chart, I'll hit your question quickly. Cup and handle pattern, I don't know if I would totally agree with that, because what a cup and handle pattern would look like, an ideal one, would be a rounded bottom, which I think you have, but then you need the rim of the cup to be pretty uh, consistent. So you'd want another high around 260, 260, 50. We kind of went a little above there. Um, and then we had this sort of briefer pullback. 
An ideal cup and handle pattern would be sort of this cup and then maybe a bigger sort of handle, right? Think of it literally the proportions of a coffee cup you might drink. And that's kind of what that pattern is meant to capture. Um, so would I call this a cup and handle pattern? No, I probably call it, call it a cup and handle like pattern. The reason why it's so important to have the uh, patterns consistent is because the rim of the cup is very important because what that means is there's a level of resistance. We trade back up to that same level. We once again don't eclipse it. And then on the third attempt, we finally break above it. And that is the trigger that would clear the way for it. Having said that, did this stock break above resistance? 100%. And, and, and getting above 260.50 and holding it would be really important, which is why two days ago, going into the weekend, ADP was a pretty decent chart, right? Not too bad. At this point, if you're long ADP, your stop is probably getting teased a little bit, depending on where you would put your uh, stop. I'm not sure how you would necessarily uh, approach this, but we're seeing some short-term weakness, right? We're not seeing follow-through. We're seeing, seeing a break to new highs, but then that uh, demand sort of evaporates, and now we're pulling back a little bit. The other issue I would have is the fact that the PPO is giving a sell signal. Look at previous rally phases when we've had that sell signal. That usually happens when the price has come off of the highs and is sort of validating a new downtrend. So I would be cautious with a name like this. And overall, you know, what, what is right? The cup and handle pattern or, or what you highlighted, the break above resistance or the momentum. I, I think at this point, it's a strong chart that now is showing, showing some short-term weakness. So as long as we hold support, as long as we would hold your stop, uh, it's probably okay. But the change in trend, particularly in some of these indicators, tell me to, tells me to be cautious about this type of name. Having having said that, if you're going to be in technology, if you're going to be in a particular sector, look at areas of that sector which are outperforming. And the long-term strength in ADP, undeniable. We need to wrap the show. The show goes by so quickly, but it's a ton of fun to put it on for you. We're going to the three and three. Three charts in three minutes to tell the story of this market environment. Here's chart number one. My chart of the S&P 500 really mirrors a lot of what um, my guest today, John Kosar, was talking about. He's a great, uh, really uh, knows the markets well. And I loved his uh, way of sort of talking through what we're seeing here. Um, you know, we've talked about calling this a bear market rally. I stand by that label until we get above this trend line and get above 4,100. We haven't done it. We're now pulling back off of those highs, which just makes me feel way more confident that this was indeed a bear market rally that is sort of sputtering out. I'm still thinking pretty defensively uh, about this market. And, and the challenge to that thesis is the seasonal strength. I didn't talk a lot about seasonality with, uh, with uh, John Kosar today, but December, November tends to be a pretty good month, which November was. December actually tends to be pretty good uh, as well. What would be interesting, what could happen, this is why I wanted to feature the chart, we could actually be more of one of those sideways markets, which uh, over half of you said was the most painful one. So buckle up because we could just sort of trade around these levels. We could rally going into year end, just the last week of the year, and it'll still uh, sort of satisfy that Santa Claus rally thesis, that, dis that uh, seasonal strength. But it's not going to be pretty. And I, I think that could be what... December actually brings. Chart number two is the McClellan Oscillator. You know, measures of breadth, we talked about a couple of them uh, today, just looking at participation, right? And how are stocks performing relative to the uh, benchmarks and the advanced decline lines coming off a bit, but still holding up okay. The McClellan Oscillator is an adaptation of the uh, pure advanced decline data. It uses exponential averages to smooth out their signals. This stays above 0%. That's pretty good. Gets below 0%. That's cause for concern. As of today's sell-off, we are really close to that zero level. We go below there, and that tells you that there is pain uh, to be had and further downside potential. Final chart here in the three and three is looking at the relative strength of consumer discretionary versus staples. I mentioned the fact that this ratio in our market recap, this ratio is near a new 52-week low. And if you're optimistic about stocks, if you're all bulled up, I would be worried about the fact that this ratio is actually making a new swing low. Now, this is cap weighted, which means Amazon and Tesla and Home Depot are a big weight in that ETF. If you look at the equal weighted version, it's more sideways. In the last eight months, essentially, have been even between offense and defense. But look at the relative strength of consumer staples versus the S&P 500. That is making a new 52-week low, excuse me, a new 52-week high today, telling you a defensive area of the market, consumer staples, really starting to outperform. So this ratio breaking down, staples outperforming, that is more characteristic of a defensive-oriented market, a down market, than a bullish market, than a constructive market. Those types of patterns cause me to be skeptical about further upside. Folks, that's a wrap for this show. Special thank you to John Kosar from Asbury Research joining us from Chicago. All of our previous interviews, some great episodes at StockChartsTV.com. For Stock Charts in Redmond, Washington, I'm Dave Keller. Have a great night. See you tomorrow. 
Hey, Grayson Rhodes here with Stock Charts. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, consider giving it a like down below. Maybe leave us a comment. And if you're new to the channel, you can subscribe at the link up above. We're gonna bring you daily content from an incredible collection of technical analysts and financial experts.